Hello and welcome to Teaching My Cat to Read, the very serious book review podcast. I'm Eli. I'm Em. And I'm Lottie. And this week we're discussing everything about Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. <laughs> with the jingle we're not going to be able to discuss everything because there is so much everything in this book this is the original everything everywhere all at once there is so yeah. much going on you Holy know God. in um you know in spirited away there's the background of like mm. the the witch's bedroom and it's the most maximalist mm. overwhelming like befuddling to the eye yeah. thing that's what this book is like yeah yeah <laughs> it, there's, there's a lot going on i think also two things to start firstly mm. this is not a spoiler free episode we are going to spoil like i think quite a few of the well the major twists in this book and plus some that stuff there that happens so at the many end. twists so i think if you have there are mm-hmm. some differences between the film and the book that the main I, I is it i think it's fair to say the main plot like beats mm. are there but there are some differences like one of the main twists what is behind the black mm. door is not the same in the film as it is in the book Mm. so Mm. that's just heads up fyi i think like maybe if i start by reading the book blurb then maybe that will like help dear listeners we were trying to summarize this both for terrible summaries and properly and we have absolutely cool because it is simply (laughs) impossible to summarize so yes lottie but blurb okay (laughs) so sophie has the great misfortune of being the eldest of three daughters destined to fail miserably should she ever leave home to seek her fortune but when she unwittingly attracts the ire of the witch of the waste sophie finds herself under a horrid spell that transforms her into an old lady her only chance at breaking it lies in the ever-moving castle in the hills the wizard howl's castle to untangle the enchantment sophie must handle the heartless howl strike a bargain with a fire demon and meet the witch of the waste head-on Along the way, she discovers that there's more to Howl and herself than first meets the eye. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah, which I think is pretty, it's pretty good introduction to like the main, the main peeps in this book and the main... Yeah. It makes everything peeps. sound a lot more intentional than it actually is yes. in the book. Yes. Like, it makes Sophie sound like she knows a bit more about what she's doing than she does. Yes. Mm. And it's like, it's very stripped down character-wise. Though I guess the, bla- the blurb has to be, doesn't it? If it's yeah. going to be about the main character. Because part of the reason it's so confusing is because there's so many moving parts and, mm. like, people that get sort of involved and cause all sorts of um, confusions and um, mm-hmm. swaps. And, yeah. And, and... and I think that's like... So Sophie, she's the eldest of the Hatter sisters. She's 18. And then there's Letty and... Oh my god, my Martha. brain absolutely. Martha. Martha, there we go. The thing about Martha is that you forget her name because for half of the well, most she's of the book, she's there. pretending to be Letty. Yeah. So whenever she's referred to, she's referred to as Letty, and it's like, no, that's not Letty. That's the other. The number of times I had to be like, which, which Letty ones, is which? being talked about? Yeah. Now? Is it the witch Letty or the pastry chef Letty? Yeah. Because they are not the same person. Yeah. The only time she gets called Martha is in Sophie's sort of private internal monologue. Mm. And then there's obviously Howl, as we mentioned. He's 27, according to Wikipedia. Does that mean he finishes PhD at 22? Because if so, like, it, f- that guy. Props. F- that guy. Hey, do we know he finished it? Just because he That's says true. he put charms and spells in his doctoral thesis doesn't mean he actually, like, ever finished or handed yeah. in the thesis. That's a good point. It's entirely possible that he, like, ran away to Ingery and made a moving castle specifically to avoid his PhD supervisor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe he did that. Which, like, mood. Yeah. Hal's got an apprentice called Michael, who's his 15 year old apprentice. Whom we love and treasure. Calcifer, resident fire demon, uh, witch of the waste. I mean, that's very, like, similar to, I guess, the Wicked Wheat. Yeah. Wicked Witch of the West in <laughs> Wizard mm. of Oz. That's the first thing I thought of, at least. Mm. Mm. And the two Hatter sisters, like Sleti is 17 and Martha is uh, the youngest. I think she's 16. No, she's younger mm. than Michael. Is she? Or is she? Uh... Who is 15. So there's a bit okay, where so she's 14. they're talking about Michael's like, oh, I've got three years left of my apprenticeship and his Letty has even more. So she must yeah. be younger than him. Yeah, I guess at the start of the book, the setup is that like Sophie's going to take over the hat shop that her parents run and Letty and Martha, I've written like get sold off because they can't afford to keep them, which I'm just like, that is, 
I, I know it's a young adult book, so you have to, I think, keep it in that context when you're thinking, why are you selling off your 14 year old child? You're not but selling them. She's you're not selling, selling them, them though. She's an apprenticeship, she which is a totally it. normal, like, um, like that was a pretty standard way of getting your kid into a career. Oh, I know. It just saying, felt like maybe hey, when I was- go to it's go get a job where you will, you know, yeah. be like qualified at the end of it, sort of thing. I, yeah. Um, which isn't to say that apprentices were never exploited because they obviously were, but like it's yeah. not. Um, yeah. It's not quite as grim as like just marrying them off. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, they try she, to be fair to the mother, like she's trying to make sure that they all have like a guess a good life, for want of a better word. Mm. Um, and she's misjudged what she thinks each of them will want. Yeah. So the two younger ones mm. end up swapping places. Yeah, because Letty, she's like air quotes the most beautiful of the three sisters, but she doesn't want to settle down and ha- get married and have kids. She wants to learn magic, and Martha wants to settle down and have kids. So that's why they end up swapping. Mm. They want each other's careers that have been chosen yeah. for them by their mum. Or stepmom in one case. Yeah, yeah. And I guess Sophie's like, because she's the oldest, she's kind of resigned herself that the fact that she has to run this hat shop. Mm. I do like the ha- the setup of the hat shop. I, I quite enjoyed it. Mm. I listened to it on audiobook and I will find the narrator in a minute <laughs> because she did a bloody good job and mm. therefore deserves a shout out. Because it's always <laughs> nice, I think, when you find like a good audiobook and a, a mm. good book because I really I did enjoy this book yeah and it and it's narrated by somebody really well anyway I'll find that in a minute we'll put it it'll be in the reference post dear listeners we yeah we'll sort that for it you it will be there it will be there thinking about Sophie feeling like she has to inherit the hat shop there's something we haven't mm. quite touched on yet which is this idea that this world is sort of a fairy tale world and everybody feels like they know mm. the rules of how it should go so Sophie has yeah. this idea that as the eldest She can never make her own fortune. She's destined to be the cautionary tale, essentially. You know, the the oldest child goes off Mm. and makes mistakes and it's the third child who succeeds in the end. And so when it's like, oh, she's going to inherit the hat shop, it's sort of this self-fulfilling prophecy where because Mm. everybody thinks that's how it should go, that's how it goes. And she herself was Mm. brought into this as well. But the younger two siblings rebel against these destinies sort of that have been chosen for them Mm. and go, actually, that doesn't sound great. I think I want what my sister has. And then they just swap. Yeah. yeah, which which I quite like actually. Oh the yeah, fact that they just go sod it. We're going to do the other one. Well, I think one of the themes of this book is sort of figuring out for yourself how much of that you you want to abide by, right? Like, do you want to fit this this archetype of you know the the wicked sorcerer or the eldest child who's a failure, or do you actually want something more for yourself? And I think it's interesting. I mean, reading this on the this is sort of my fourth or fifth go round reading this, but like it was interesting to read the opening pages again and have it kind of go welcome to the land of Ingery where things like seven league boots and witches and whatnot are really real and blah 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 blah. and talking about the um yeah introducing Sophie as the oldest of three um siblings and thus never going to amount to anything and you establish really early on that there is a world where there aren't seven league boots is heaven is implied by the there's a world where these are really real Mm mm-hmm that this world runs on fairy tale rules, and then immediately afterwards, it disproves that by saying that. Um, so the the family setup is that Martha's actually the step sibling of a half sister. Yes, that one. I know words. <laughs> Shush. Um, <laughs> she's the um, yeah. She's the kid of the second marriage of the Hatter patriarch, who we never meet. And there's a line really early on that's like, and this ought to have made Sophie and Letty ugly sisters, but actually they all got on really well and they're all really pretty, so eh. Yeah, and and Fanny never favoured her daughter, Martha, over the others, and she treated them all yeah, with yeah, equal yeah. kindness. And so it's it's kind of, it immediately goes, okay, so either this world runs on fairy tale rules or everybody just thinks it does because we've immediately established that it's not actually destiny in the first couple of chapters. And I think the whole book is like Sophie's process of like learning to actually like look at what's in front of her and not about the stories, not just like believe anything that people say Mm -hmm. about things. Well, because there's a moment in the book where she goes, oh, I've taken somebody else's opinion of another person at face value. And even though I disagreed with it and I wish I hadn't done that. And it's all fine and there's no consequence for it really. But yeah. Martha says some stuff about um, Fanny exploiting her. Mm, exactly. Yeah, and and she's she's like she's not a hundred percent convinced, but it is on her mind when she makes the decision 
when she gets turned old to sort of run off into the wilderness and not let any of her family help her. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of the instigating incident of this book is Sophie decides to go and see one of her sisters after they've all sort of gone to their apprenticeships and Sophie is being apprenticed at the hat shop. On May Day, she decides to go and visit one of her sisters, the one that's working in the bakery. And along the way, she runs into a handsome young gentleman and nothing particularly comes of that. She goes to see her sister who turns out to be not the sister she thought because they swap places. And then it's like literally the next day or something, the Witch of the Waste comes into her shop and turns her old. Yeah. Um, and Sophie's like, mm. huh, well, I'd better leave home. And that's it, 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 <laughs> later that it says like she's basically in shock for the entirety of that day. But she just yeah. sort of very calmly goes, okay, sort of puts all her belongings into the little bindle, you know, the thing that you put your stick over your shoulder and you've got a... Yeah. It's very much that kind of energy where she's just like, right, okay, well, I guess I'd better go and be old elsewhere and she just yeah, sets off walking yeah. and she doesn't know where she's going and she ends up in Howl's Moving Castle I, I did love <laughs> about when she's turned old and I think it's probably her internal monologue or when she's walking towards Howl's Ooh. Castle because she realises she needs somewhere to go and the one place where she wouldn't be found would be Howl's Castle is like her internal monologue of realising she kind of <laughs> the no f- <laughs> to give attitude that you get yes. when you get older. Like when she's 18, she's really worried about what other people think of her and other people's opinions of anything she says or anything she does. And then she just becomes this old lady and goes, meh, I can do what I want now. Or, you know, she, she kind of doesn't, doesn't It's hilarious care. that people keep mistaking me for a witch and think I'm mad yeah. and scared of me. Yeah. I love this for me. I'm going to lean into it. I read it slightly differently. Not that she necessarily like cares a lot about people's opinions, although she does because she needs to like keep customers to keep the hat shop running. But like, she's very mm. resigned to what she thinks is her place in the world and what her life is going to look like. Mm. She knows that she wants more, but she's unwilling to try and get it because she thinks she's not like allowed by the rules of her world. Yeah. And then mm. getting turned old just completely breaks through all of that. And she just goes, might as well. You know, might as well do whatever the hell I want. Yeah. Mm. But you see that later on, it is the being old that is allowing her to do that. And so she is also, like, she, that's part of why she likes it. She likes being old because it gives her this freedom. And part mm. of the book is, mm. well, I think I, one of the arcs, I think, is her realizing that she can have that freedom without being old. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think it it becomes later, it becomes a thing. And actually, I mean, it's a thing earlier as well. Like, part of the reason she... Because we... When we're introduced to Hal, it's very much in a, like... There is a distant, spooky castle that's walking around on the moors, making loud and terrifying noises and, like, clouds of smoke and things. And there are these rumours going around that Wizard Hal... um, Eats girls' hearts. Steals Mm. girls' hearts and eats their souls and things. And Sophie kind of... Sophie believes that to start with. And she's, like... You know, it's, it's something that she's quite nervous about. And then when she's old, she's just like, oh, well, obviously Hal's not going to want to steal my heart because I'm not young and beautiful. So I'll be safe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's this this sort of like both protection magical and then later, I think, actually sort of emotional where she's like, well, because I'm old, I'm safe from Hal in a like a magic sense of he won't be interested in my heart. And also in a metaphorical sense of, well, obviously Hal's not going to pursue me romantically or um, and obviously I'm safe but from that because I'm old and old people don't do this or old people aren't romantically attractive or... It's the sort of equivalent of pulling an, an ugly face in a photo to deliberately be ugly so that you don't try and look good and look awkward, right? You know that mm. that thing of like, well, I'm deliberately going to pull a, pull a st- silly face yeah, and then yeah, I'm yeah. doing it on purpose. And it's a mm. it's a sort of... Not quite cowardice, but it's you are sort of mm. running away from something slightly, and it's made all the funnier that Sophie calls Howler a slitherer out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is one of my favourite phrases. And says that he's shirking responsibilities or running from things when she's doing the exact mm. same. Well, and I think the whole. I mean, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Oh, it's very early to be talking about the terms of the deal mm. that Howl made yeah. with Calcifer, but I do think that is exactly the same thing for him. Is a like. He's slithering out of any possibility of emotional vulnerability mm. and Calcifer's slithering out of dying, which to be fair, yeah. that's that's fair. That's, that's pretty honest. defensible. Valid. Yeah. But like they are they are both starting on their sort of magic journeys from the same place in a way. Mm. Um, which is interesting. Yeah. I think like Calcifer, who's the fire demon that runs runs the castle and makes it move. Mm. And 
I because I've watched the film and I haven't read this book before. I've, my only reference mm. point is the film. He's much less cute in the book. Yeah, I know he's much <laughs> less cute in the book. And all I just had in my head was like the cute little fire with the little like big beady mm. eyes. Mm. I'm just like, oh, I just want yeah. my little calcifer. But calcifer's mm-hmm. agreement, he knows Sophie's under a curse. So he's going to, he he has the agreement that he will remove the curse if she can break the contract between Howl and calcifer. However, calcifer can't say what the contract is. So Sophie's got to work it out. And I have a, I have a tally. I have a tally in the bottom of my notebook, which oh, is how many um, hints? the number of times that calcifer calls Howl heartless. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it, it's um. What what I do love is Sophie's like, right, I've got to stay here because this is my way out to stop becoming old. So what I'm going to do is become a like the, a sort of the housekeeper of this castle because it's an absolute tip. The fact that she can't clean his bathroom, and he always has like really dramatic. He's sort of how I just he's very. He always wears like colorful, like brightly colored suits and. And he always would, he would go out and effectively try and woo the latest lady that he's fallen in love with. And he'd come back and always have like a really dramatic bath. Like, he's just got to come back and like, I, I need to have a bath. I'm like, okay, are you five? There's the whole two hour, two, I think it's mm. before, it's the preparation yeah. to go and woo the ladies. Mm. There's the two hour bath and the makeup uh, and, and like, the hair. And the- what I love is that he has this mm. reputation and clearly this is a thing he has done a lot, is this womanising mm. kind of behaviour. But we never actually see him do it in this book because the two women that he's yeah. quote unquote going after, um, turns out that he is cultivating relationships with them not to boo them, um, but for other purposes, mm. which is, I think is quite interesting. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's another, it's part and parcel of that. I mean, I think we, Michael and Calcifer are more reliable witnesses than well, how? the the townsfolk of market chipping on like how much ro- like romancing he's yeah. been doing. But the, the, I mean, I did enjoy the whole, like, um, Sophie thinks he eat, he's been eating girls' hearts and then, um, it turns out that actually Howell asked Michael to spread that rumour so that um, people would stop, like, coming up to the castle and being like, hey, take responsibility for making my daughter fall in love with you. He it gets threatened with aunts at one point, so he's basically a Worcester, <laughs> is yeah, what, we've, yeah, what we yeah. learned from this. And I guess Michael kind of does the running of the day-to-day business. Um, he's the one yeah. who collects, like, the money from the spells that, you know how's made and make sure it goes to the right place and yeah he he i mean to be fair at 15 that's pretty he's basically running his own job for his 27 year old useless <laughs> employer like when when you put the ages to it you're like okay how is just if how was like 18 i i kind of feel it would make more sense but the fact he's like 27 i'm like how have you not got your shit together but anyway that's not that's that Babe. I've known people not older Babe. than that with their shit less together. I know, I know. Listen, if I could have gotten away with, at 27, if I could have gotten away with, I've run off to a magical land where a castle moves around for me and runs away from all my responsibilities for me. Um, I can take two hour baths and like do absolutely f*** all with my time, apart from occasionally cast cool magic. Like, buddy. I'm not saying he's got his shit together, but the way in which he has not got his shit together is peculiarly attractive to me. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's put it I'm that I'm just way. like, please, please just, you know, clean your house. But anyway. <laughs> and I, I guess up to this point, the film does sort of align with the beats mm. of the book. I mm. assume it aligns with the beats of the prince and the king. No. It, it doesn't particularly. No, that bit's quite different. It doesn't. So that's kind of where I think it then diverges. I think it, it cuts Wizard Solomon. Mm. Um, and it cuts Mrs. Penstemon. Yeah. Oh, I thought she was in it. It's been a long time since I saw that movie. Oh, oh she is, but she's she's just like the oh, she's like the right hand of the king. Yeah, isn't she in like, a wheelchair? It's a in very different character. Yeah. In, in the in the book, there's Wizard Sullyman, who is I guess this wizard. He's the royal wizard. The royal wizard and Prince Justin, the king's like younger brother, had gone missing while searching for Wizard Sullyman. And there's Mrs. Pentstemon, who who was Hal's teacher, am I correct, in, yes. in magic? Yes. She was basically everybody who is currently active doing magic. She was at one point their teacher. It's not not the Witch of the Waste, though, because the Witch of the Waste is like turbo old and keeping herself alive through magic. Yeah. But like Solomon, Howell, the witch that Martha gets apprenticed to, that Letty ends up taking the, the, that apprenticeship 
that which was mm. also taught by Miss Pentstemon. Yeah. So she's like beloved by everybody who does magic. I, I don't think Sophie has sisters in the film. I think it's just Sophie. I don't think we ever see the others, do we? I think, yeah, you probably have to trim it down a lot. And I think that is probably why one of the biggest deviations in this book uh, mm. Sorry, in the film from the book mm. and massive. Well, I say yeah, it's massive spoilers from like I guess the the point in the plot deviation. So if you're wanting to, if you're got to this point in the episode, you think mm, I want to actually read this book, pause the episode, go to read the fair, book, and then come it's, back. It's, wait, we're not quite at like Gideon the Ninth levels, but I am. The more we talk about it, the more I'm like nobody's going to get any comprehensible plot from this. No, like, I mean that I barely, is fair. It was like the fourth or fifth time I read it, and I still don't fully understand what was going on. So I'm not convinced anything we say is going to actually <laughs> give the. <laughs> well, okay. So major spoiler coming up. Mm. Howl is from Wales in the 1970s. Yeah. That's what's behind the black door. The, the the when you turn the black blob to be at the bottom of the inside of the door. This door that can open into multiple places. Mm. And in the movie, that's not at all true. No. Well, because I think there's a in the movie they they're trying for a whole um like war is hell thing going on in the background so in behind the black door is like the war front and how sneaking out in the dead of night to like go and fight to go fight the you know prevent um people from getting horribly uh what'sited in the war and in in the book he's going to take new made up magic video games to his niece and nephew and yeah. spoil them rotten and occasionally court random women um, uh, random english teachers who yeah. happen to what what I loved about the reveal because I didn't know I didn't know this and I think maybe it's why it stuck with me is firstly in the audiobook Hal has a really soft Valley's Welsh accent it is like and the only way I can describe it it is like if you've ever watched Gavin and Stacey it's Rob Brydon's character like was it Bryn and so it's like a very yeah. sort of very friendly Welsh accent I'm thinking oh that's quite nice because I've listened to quite a few audiobooks it's quite nice when the narrator does uh, a f- like variety of accents and especially mm. like I guess like British accents as well like from from mm. from everywhere yeah, so regional accents my beloved so I, I was quite like I quite <laughs> like okay this is quite nice because it like di- di- helps differentiate the characters and then when they go through the black door and and it's from Sophie's perspective which is just so brilliantly written and she's mm. like oh how changed into some red clothing which had the words Welsh rugby written on the back and i was like oh my god he's actually like welsh Michael's reaction to being in jeans yeah he's like, what are these why can't i walk this is so uncomfortable i hate it and then it got to go to car and there's no like horses on the car and then and they Sophie go to... terrified and horrified by Sophie the car. hates the car Sophie gets mad car sick yeah and mm-hmm. and they go to um his his sister's house mm. For plot reasons related to the curse that the Witch of the Waste has put on him. Yeah, and, and they thought, like, Michael and Sophie had this, effectively, this first half of this poem, um, and they didn't mm. recognise, they thought it was an actual, like, like spell. And it wasn't. It's the mm. first half of a, I, I say reasonably well-known poem, I hadn't heard of it before. I mean, I, I know it, but only because it's in the front of um, Stardust, the Neil Gaiman. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Oh, uh, catching a falling star, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, how's like? Oh, we gotta go. We gotta go um, to Wales to get like the the actual spell that this is related from. It's, it's it's his it's his nephew's English homework. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that's how it is. It's his nephew's English homework, and I really enjoyed when they were talking because it's from Sophie's point of view and the more Mm. you slowly pick up that the fact that you know he this is just a very standard I guess suburban Mm. Welsh home with his nieces and nephews and Mm. they're playing computer games and they're playing outside and House is like just please run with everything just run with it just 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 please play along for the love of god and they're like like, okay a really fun thing of the like like Sophie coming from a fairy tale world and not like knowing what electricity is, and that the the computer is a magic box that has long white roots that yeah. are flowing out of a wall, and and all of this stuff. It's a lot of fun to be kind of going, oh man, I'm trying to work out what it is that she's seeing mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. like her comprehension of it. It was fun coming back to it, and I remembered enough of it this time to be like. Oh, when Calcifer singing a song in a language that Sophie doesn't understand, except she recognises the word saucepan, I'm like, aha, saucepan vach. And the the fact that the she describes the English homework, the piece of paper, as having like these like blurry grey 
bits around the edges and being printed in this really fuzzy way First and you're just going burn. oh it's a photocopy uh-huh. it's a oh, photocopy it's a fo- oh i didn't pick up on that but yeah that's i mean uh, i didn't the first few times like mm. this is a this is a, i went in with a like okay this time I'm going to build on all of the things that I already remember about this and I'm going to be paying attention and I'm going to be taking notes. There's just this is so the only much. reason that I picked up There's on any so of this. There's just so much going on and everything is relevant. Like, I read this twice mm. today. I did the time-honoured podcast tradition of reading the book on the day that we record the episode. Uh, mm-hmm, and I read it mm-hmm. twice because I got to the end and I was like oh god okay everything was relevant from the first page. Like there's so many yeah. Chekhov's guns like littered throughout this book. Like the Scarecrow yeah. turns out to be it, extremely plot relevant this scarecrow that sophie comes across when she's mm. on her initial wander having just left home and, and being like Fuck it why not the dog's relevant yeah the, the fact that she meets a random guy in the market on her way to her sister's relevant mm-hmm. the fact that it's the english homework specifically is relevant yep. like yeah just yeah all of it is it, it's so well put together every time i every time i reread it i'm just like this is both a masterwork of construction and also like I'm still not 100% certain what happens in the last two chapters. Like, it's so detailed that you really can't take it all in at once, which is both Mm. incredible, but also, I I don't know, kind of a downside to me in that Mm. I sort of, I don't know. It's one of those things where I was was having, I'm having enough fun to disregard it, but like, it is, yeah, and my brain does sort of melt a bit at the last chapter or so. I still don't understand. So another another spoiler is that the English Mm. teacher of Hal's nephew in Wales is also mm. in in Ingery is the fire demon that's made a contract with the witch of the waste. So both Howl and the witch of the waste have made contracts with fire demons, and mm. this English teacher happens to be the witch of the waste's fire demon. And I don't know if yeah. that like I don't know how, quite how that works because Calcifer mm. doesn't look like a human, but this fire demon clearly does, and mm. has been living has a counterpart in real like you know Wales. Mm who has somehow got herself into the position of being the English teacher of Hal's nephew so that this mix up with the spell and the poem can happen mm. and it's a curse on Howl. I really don't like, yeah. is that, is that all coincidence? Is that intentional? It's never really made clear. No. So, so when, when the witch of the ways comes into the, the hat shop, mm-hmm. she's not just, I mean, she, I know she says she's looking for a hat, but it turns out later that she's come in to find out because about Wales. she thinks that, yeah, she thinks that Sophie is Letty and that Letty knows about Wales because of a mix-up with the whole... With the person uh, that she's trying to extort the information out of in the first place. Yes, yes, mm. yes. Um, so she's trying to find out about Wales because she thinks that's the easiest way to get At the curse to Howl. So presumably, I think what was what has happened is that she find, she does find out about Wales eventually, sends her fire demon through... Fire demon, because they're very old and very powerful, inveigles their way into being the English teacher of Hal's nephew, mm-hmm. puts the curse in the homework. I think the fact it's kind of implied that like the curse wouldn't have got there if Sophie hadn't been nosy and opened the black door. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I guess maybe eventually it would have, because Hal would have come to visit or... Yeah, yeah. I think it was probably inevitable. Mm. It definitely feels that way when we, because like once you find, once you find out that that's what, that's the curse. Mm-hmm. How's like, oh, there's only three things left and you're sort of like, there's three conditions to be met. And the way those three conditions get met across the course of the rest of the book feels very like, yeah, you couldn't have avoided this. There was just, yeah, you know, this was always going to happen. But for such a short yeah. book, it's like 200 pages or something. There is just so much going on. There is so much mm. going on. Like, it, it, it's one of those books where I think I have, I, I would have to, you know, reread, re-listen to it mm. again to pick up all yeah. those, those small, those small nuances. Mm. I guess we said, you know, if you've, if you've read this book before or not, but like, I guess what's kind of your biggest takeaway from the book? Like, what was your favourite mm. calling point? Because I, I, I really enjoyed that. Like there were lots of little things like when Howl has an issue with the hair dye and he goes absolutely mm-hmm. bonkers because his hair's not the right colour because Sophie had done cleaning. Howl expresses his feeling with feelings with green slime. And 
Yeah. All I thought was, I was like, oh, this is just like, you know, when everyone had lockdown hair and like you watch these YouTube videos, there was a, there was a great series by this like, hairdresser guy who went through all these hair fail videos. And that is the first thing I thought of was, like, oh, he's just had a lockdown hair day. <laughs> that's Brad Mondo, right? The YouTuber who does yeah, looks yeah, at, yeah, 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 that's the one. And it was just that I was like, oh, that, that is what happened there. I love people who make those uh, who do like videos of them dyeing their hair at home. And they say like, sorry, Brad Mondo, before they do it, because they know that he's going to see their video. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, how how getting really like vain about his appearance? Mm. Throwing massive dramatic tantrums about it while um, Sophie's just like, I "Why think... are you like this? Oh my god!" Sophie uses eldest sibling powers against him, which is good. She's like, mm. "I have seen scarier tantrums, even if they did not feature green slime. Mm-hmm. I have absolutely no sympathy for you. Go 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 into the bathroom while we deal with the mess that you have made." Yeah. <laughs> The thing that I came away from this book thinking about the most was like the love that's within Sophie's family, because Mm. even when she's old and she's sort of like basically run away, she doesn't stop worrying about her sisters. So there's a bit where it looks very much like Howell is courting Letty, the real Letty, who's now learning witchcraft. Um, And Sophie's horrified because he has this reputation for loving and leaving girls and leaving them brokenhearted and, you know, eating, eating their hearts, uh, metaphorically. Mm Um, and so she's she's very invested in either trying to make sure he leaves well alone or that he actually commits to her. Uh, it turns out that he was never actually courting her. He was actually trying to find out information about Sophie, who Letty has let slip is actually her sister, uh, rather than her mm. great great aunt or whatever Sophie's been saying because Sophie looks old. Um, because mm. spoiler again, Howell has been in love with Sophie from the start, the day he met her in, in May Day. But Sophie is so worried about both her sisters who are having like all these suitors come after them. And throughout the book, there's this theme of her being worried, like not wanting to go and see her sisters or her stepmother because she doesn't want them to not recognize her. Like, she's afraid of them seeing just an old woman and not recognizing her, and it would hurt. But when she does mm. actually see them, they recognize her instantly. They're just like, we wish you'd told us. We wish you'd, you know, uh, come and seen mm. us. And it's it's just this really sweet thing where she and her sisters and the stepmother all clearly love each other and are looking out for each other and involved mm. in each other's lives. So when she yeah. sees her stepmother, who has who has remarried to a very rich man, it's like, and, and Sophie goes, oh, well, I, I, you know, cynically, like, oh, I guess she married into money, blah, blah, blah. And then the stepmother recognizes her, even though she looks old, and goes, Oh my God, Sophie, where have you been? I've had a reward out. I've been looking for you everywhere. No one has any idea where you are. And, you know, like five minutes later, they're like holding each other's hands and crying and laughing and very glad to see each other. Mm. And it's just so earnest and sweet. And I love that very much. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I get a different takeaway from it every time I read it. I think I get something else out of it. And I think this time, this time I was so, I was very plot focused because I did sit down going, this time, this time I am going to understand what is happening. And I think I'm like 80% of the way there, maybe. Maybe between us we have 100. I think I understand <laughs> reasonably well what's gone on in the plot. There are a few mm. details, like, for example, they're like, oh, how did this person end up being the English teacher that I'm a little fuzzy on, but. Yeah, th- I think I think that was confusing to me. If I'm honest, I think like- the timeline's a bit weird because the I think a lot of the stuff, all of, a lot of the prequel stuff that you need for the plot to make sense is happening while Sophie's working in the hat shop. Mm. So Prince Justin going to Mrs. Fairfax and Letty for the finding spell for Wizard Solomon is happening while Sophie's working in the hat shop. Mm-hmm. And the Witch of the Waste trying to find out about Wales is happening while Sophie's working in the hat shop. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the setup that, like, for things that feel like they come out of nowhere for Sophie are things that, like, she didn't see because she was... Actually, this is... Here's my takeaway from from this read. I think it's really... I really enjoyed the, tra- the, the character arc of... Sophie's kind of depressed mm. and kind of anxious yeah. in the first. And, you know, I think it's... When Jones doesn't like draw a direct line between like you know the fact that her father's died and that her her mother her birth mother has like died a while before presumably as well, um, and you know her whole life has changed really dramatically. Her sisters aren't there anymore. Her her dad's dead. 
And she's very isolated doing this job that she doesn't particularly enjoy and very resigned to thinking that nothing's ever going to change. And working for a stepmother who she might think somewhere in her brain is the Mm. idea that the stepmother secretly doesn't really love her because that's how things are, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the conversation where she's like, oh, um, wage, wage maybe. And the, the mother and the stepmother's like, oh, yeah, sure, of course, you're absolutely right. And then seems to forget all about it. Mm. I think it's much more likely to be that Fanny's just very absent-minded rather than she's deliberately trying to exploit Sophie. Mm-hmm. Particularly since, oh, that's another thing that's happening while Sophie's working in her hat shop, is a lot of the things that turn out to be relevant later are caused by hats that she's accidentally cast spells on in the hat shop. Yeah. Yeah, because she doesn't know that she's magic until like two thirds through the book. Yeah, yeah, like people who help her out later turn out to have been people who like benefited from her getting the hat and like fanny fanny's second marriage is related to one of sophie's hats and that random guy that she gives kn so he can have a a fair duel yeah yeah as the guy that married the girl that bought the terrible hat yes yeah and so there's there's all this i forget where i was going with this but like there's a lot of setup that happens that that um sophie just Mm. isn't party to essentially yeah 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 yeah. so while she's in her depression haze, there is mm-hmm. a lot of other stuff happening that she she's not tracking, which is you know completely fair and valid and understandable. And I like I like the way it sort of I enjoy the the way that that she ends up getting story momentum is just getting mad mm-hmm. because I think like that's a that's still progress from going to feeling you know very resigned and very quiet and very anxious. So getting, like, I think she snaps at a customer at one point, and she's a little bit, I mean, she's rude to the Witch of the Waste, but but the Witch of the Waste is rude first, so that's, you know. Yeah, that's that's fair game. But, like, there's a lot of story and momentum from her just, like, getting big mad about stuff. So, as I said earlier, she's, like, in shock for the rest of the day after she gets cursed. And then the Mm. next day, it's this bit where she was, like, she realised that she'd been in shock, and suddenly she was absolutely furious with the Witch of the Waste, like, oh, what I won't do to her, going into people's shops and turn them old. Yeah. (laughs) And, like, that is quite like that is quite a realistic response to certain things like there are some situations Mm. where you only realize how bad they are once you're a little bit further away from them um and you don't have the you don't you can't access anger on your own behalf in some situations yeah Mm. do do you guys think because like you say there is a lot going on in this book and it is a relatively short book do you think it could have been trimmed down or do Mm. you think having all of those pieces there means that it is one of those books where you kind of get more from rereading it i think if anything it could do with more room to breathe i don't think you could trim it down without losing a lot of it yeah i I certainly i wouldn't want to trim it down i think i definitely and can confirm i have gotten like a lot out of rereading it multiple times even just Um, rereading from the angle of like okay now let me go and read this knowing that mm. Howell is in love with Sophie from the beginning and all of the other like quote unquote courtships. Okay, so I want to, I want to, I want to push back on that okay. a little bit because I'm not a hundred percent convinced that he's, I don't know that he's in love with her from the beginning. I, that's not how I, that's not how I read it. But this is the, this is the bit where I'm like the bit that I haven't, the, the 20 to 10% that I haven't got yet uh-huh. is the, I uh, track me tracking how, what Howell knows when, and how he feels about it. So the only time mm. he actually gets interested in Letty is after she mm. mentions that Sophie is her sister. And that's when he... Yes, but I, I very much read that when that comes out, mm. the context is very much in the... He's trying to work out how to undo the old old spell. Okay, yeah, sure. I guess less... Um, less he was in love with her from the beginning, but more like he was interested in her and he was trying to help her, mm. even though he wasn't friendly yeah and i mean i think i like do i think he's um interested from the like like in her as a person from the get-go yes but i do like and the whole the whole thing of like um calcifer having his heart and how tending to like people that calcifer likes Mm. well the first time he meets her as old old woman is her cooking Mm. on the fire and calcifer's Mm. like she bullied me i didn't really think of that actually Mm. Because I mean, uh, why I think that that a- again, look, a la the sense and sensibility mm. episode. Mm. Halves twenty seven, she's eighteen. It doesn't sit right with me that they love each other. From a like 
emotional maturity standpoint in age like if someone Mm. who was 27 started dating someone who was 18 everyone would go yikes like yeah it's different than if it was a 27 and a 36 year old like those nine years represent a much bigger gap in maturity when they are those ages that that's Mm. like that just didn't sit right with me it kind of made me sort of draw away from the story Mm. He is very immature, but that isn't. I know he's very immature, but that doesn't help. (laughs) No, 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 I know. It it is sort of she's so so therefore she's an eighteen year old effectively caretaking a twenty seven immature year like immature twenty seven year old man. It either he needs to be younger or she needs to be older. So I don't disagree with you. Here is here is my here is my thing about Howell. Right. So we find out that the deal with him and Calcifer is that. The contract that they have is that Calcifer has his heart, and Hal's heart is keeping Calcifer alive. Calcifer would die otherwise, and in return, Hal gets access to more magic, more powerful magic. And this deal was made like five years ago, and the, the way it came about was that Calcifer was originally a falling star, and Hal caught him. And if the falling star falls to Earth, it will die, and Calcifer did not want to die, and Hal felt bad for him. He pitied him, and he said, "Okay." let's let's make this contract right where i give you my heart and it's this completely like mm. silly very selfless thing to do he wasn't doing it for the magic he was doing it because he went oh sh- i've qu- I- i'm now responsible for this falling star right that i've caught and mm. since then he's not really able to like he says something about like not being able to love properly anymore and that's the root of his womanizing behaviors that's what's led him to get into the situation with the witch of the waste like sort of mm. all his problems Apart from, you know, he is a slitherer outer and he is very selfish. And, like, those things are just who he is. But a lot of his problems come from this selfish act, a uh, selfless act that he made, like, five years ago. I think that's quite compelling. Like, mm. the reason he's in this bind, he's in the soup with the Witch of the Waste, is, um, <laughs> is partly down to the fact that he's done this, like, quite noble thing that nobody knows about. So that makes him much more sympathetic to me. Which is very true of, like, a lot of his kindnesses. Um, it, doesn't co- it doesn't at all contradict the whole like age gap ick factor but i think that sort of some of his immaturity and some of like i was about to sort of say something about oh he you know he was doing kind of fine on his own without sophie like she's not caretaking him except he wasn't he was in all of this hot mess except that all the hot mess kind of came about because of this this tragic backstory type thing i feel you can have the book basically the same and just sophie being aged up a little bit or him aged down a little bit you know to 20 you could have sold that but i think it would be extra funny if he was 24 and running around being like yeah i completed my phd five years ago (laughs) it it would have been implausible but maybe then just age her up make her like in her early 20s she could easily be 21 yeah i mean i know it's not quite the same thing but like she is 90 for most of the book my guy oh i know (laughs) no no i get that but it's just like i know she's the same person and everything but like if we're if we're looking at the like and if we look at the actual like what the dynamic is because from my perspective i like i was not registering their ages at all like that did not show up for me in the book in the way they interacted with each other they're very much peers really I feel like. at all like the closest you get is that you do get the sense that hal has more experience like he's been out in the world more than sophie has like that is not that's not in dispute i don't think but like it doesn't the the places that it helps him are not places that, like, impinge on their relationship all that much. Like, he knows how to talk to the king. He's been to the palace before, you know? He knows how to drive a car. This this sort of thing. But, like, the, the sort of... The actual dynamic that they have is very much her trying to work out how far she can, like, stop enabling him before he starts throwing green slime around. Uh, her yelling at him... Her, like, clearing everything out of his his house without asking him. Um, Doing, and, like, the only, he, yeah, okay. I mean, if if we want to talk about, yeah, the experience, yeah, I'll give you. But in terms of, like, power dynamic, literally the only thing he knows about her when she walks into his house is that she's an extremely powerful witch. Mm. And then all they do is argue. I find it less gross than in Uprooted actually thinking of another mm. young yeah. powerful magic girl ends up sort of yeah that mm. that one felt more icky to me yeah I, I i do agree with you on that and i still i, I still liked that one mm. 
yeah, I mean, like I said, it just didn't register for me because nobody like explicitly said their ages and there's nothing in the dynamic that makes me go, oh man, this is somehow um, predatory or unbalanced. Like, I wouldn't call their relationship healthy per se. Yeah, but okay. Yeah, no. It- <laughs> like, like the bit at the end where they're like, she's like, you'll exploit me. And he's like, yeah, and you'll cut up my suits to teach me a lesson. I'm like, maybe learn some like nonviolent communication methods or something. Yeah, you need to go to group 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 counselling together um, <laughs> to learn how to better communicate feelings. But it doesn't mean it's not a um, it's not a representation of a relationship. I think. I think it's pretty much it's it's maybe worth mentioning at this point that Deanna Wynne Jones was, was very um, was not expecting people to think Howell was like a good guy that they were madly in love with. Mm. Like she was very surprised that that was a reception. That, that it got that people found Howell in any way appealing. She was like, I wrote him to be like the most annoying gra- garbage gremlin there ever was. And I'm very confused at the, why people like him so much. I, I would be confused. Um, I, I, I agree with Diana Wynne-Jones. I was like, this guy sounds like an arsehole. Is he, is he a little meow meow? I don't think he's, um, he's committed enough atrocities, but he's on that sort of spectrum, right? Where people look at him and mm-hmm. go sort of he is the hero of this piece therefore he must be like good and admirable and then mm. just sort of blinker themselves to the the green the yeah. green slime <laughs> also like i don't know it's not interesting if they can talk to it if they they just sort of talk to each other in a normal i like the i like the like him calling her mrs nose and busy old fool unruly sophie and the i guess the kind of where i where i'm kind of sitting at with it and maybe this is just a like my favourite literary romance of all time is Lord Peter Whimsey and um, Harriet Vane, and their dynamic is very much like we would be bored if we were comfortable. The only reason, the only reason we are like at all like willing to contemplate getting married with the, all of the like compromises and and what's it that this will entail is because it will make things interesting, you know. It will, it's gonna, it's, it's a, it's a motive force in our lives that will like, we're both chaotic together and we're, it's gonna be this like constant dance to kind of get this right and we're always gonna have to work at it and it's always gonna be unstable. But it's interesting. We'd be bored without it. It would be, we're not, we've actively made the choice to be on, like, to not seek comfort in this thing specifically but rather to be like I don't know constantly challenged I guess and for Mm. me this is much more that kind of thing is that it's not the way that they are in love is very much like a it's compelling I wouldn't want it for myself but it is compelling yeah which again it's a book yeah, it's not exactly. real. Yeah, it's yeah, supposed yeah. to be compelling. It doesn't matter if it, we, you know, none of us would want to be in that relationship in real life. But um, does it pass the moral purity test? I have to know before I can admit publicly to liking well, it. Well, yeah. This is, yeah, I'm, 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 I've got to We're say, I'm kind that. of like, I am fully running out of patience with that. Oh, on I know. The internet oh, and yeah. in life more generally. I'm kind of like, if it's not real, I don't, I don't feel like I need to be like, oh, obviously I know that. I, I, as a 28-year-old, would never date an 18-year-old, but I enjoyed this relationship. We don't need to go there. Yeah. I like that Tumblr post there. where it was like, oh, we need to acknowledge this thing, this bad thing that a character has done. It's like, why? Is he running for Senate? Like, you know, it, it's it's yeah. not real. Well, it's the whole um the thing of, like, people will get more mad at a fictional character for being annoying than they will for genocide. And it's like, yeah, I'm here for, like, it, it's not real. If the character annoys me, that is less, that is more, that matters more than if I like the character, but the character is also like. Oh, fictional doing genocide. Evil okay, things. cool. cool, cool. I, think, like, I think, I think. Real. <laughs> what's interesting about Howell is that because he is annoying, like you say, there is this fairy tale place where in fairy tales, everything, everyone's like the hero or the villain. It's very like black and white thinking. You know, he has done a very noble thing of saving Calcifer and. I think it's one of those aspects that it just shows that people aren't, aren't like completely perfect. People are infallible. People have multifacets. You know, he can be noble, but also be a bit annoying. Well, you have that also with um, with Fanny. And also, like, there's no there's no story if they don't have the specific character flaws that they have. Yes, I right? do agree. Like, yes, there's no story if Sophie doesn't get 
eventually break out of the grey mouseness to, like, yell at the Witch of the Waste. There's no story if she doesn't get mad enough at the castle for running for running away from her to, like, cast a spell on it. There's no story if she... You know, and there's no story if Howl isn't a slitherer outer who, yeah. um, like, can't be emotionally honest to save his life. And, yeah, I don't know. It's, um... It's what it's what propels the story forward, and I kind of get the vibe that that's why it's a good relationship. It's a relationship that they want to be in, is because it makes yeah, yeah. I don't really know a good way of putting it, but it makes stuff happen. Mm. Makes makes narrative go boom. Shall we ask our fun questions of this book? Because <laughs> I think we should. Um, who do you think gets the f bomb? Oh, Sophie. In this book, Michael. <gasps> Ooh. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Actually, yeah, I think I... listen. He's doing. He's running around. You know, he's 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 got the um, irresponsible wizard who has never said a word about him. Also, sort of moving into his house without asking. And he's like, he's an orphan who's learning magic, and his boss is like his boss slash like guardian is just like I'm gonna randomly spend a bunch of money on a, all our money on a skull and a guitar, and it will turn out to be plot relevant later. But at the time, it is just like we would like to eat, please. Yeah, and and not once does has Michael actually like attempted to curse him or like hit him with a broom or um, any of the things that Sophie has done when she's gotten big mad at him. Yeah, <laughs> he's a saint and he should get to say f- at least once. Yeah, <laughs> I also think it would be funny if that was the only word that the skull ever said. <laughs> On mansplain manipulate male wife, who's what? Hmm. See, there are, are they, are they I was all about to say there aren't very many men in this book, and then I'm like, I'm counting, and there are, but like, also they don't really say, uh, with the exception of Howl and Michael, they're not really like saying very much on account of how one is a dog most of the time and one is a scarecrow most of the time. Um, I think they're all Howl. <laughs> I, hmm, I'm not a hundred percent on the that he actually mansplains. I think he mostly okay, he just sure. simply doesn't tell people. Yes, things. okay, no, he, that he is not mansplaining. He I is think the, okay. The closest we get to him mansplaining is um, the bit where he's he's telling Sophie that he tried to break the spell and then assumed that she, he's like, oh, I just assumed you liked being old mm. because you keep putting the spell back on yourself. Which, to be fair, he's correct, or like not that she likes it, but she's. She's using it as a as a shield, as a way to not have to confront things. And the king's a bit. The king's a bit meh. He's fine. Yeah, I think. It, mm, is he manipulate? I don't. I guess. No, yeah, I, I guess so. he kind of is to a degree. I mm. think howlers manipulate more, especially if you take into account his womanizing well, no, I guess, tendencies. I, I, will, I will give you how being um, manipulative because he's very much like. Um, anytime anybody's like, actually, I won't do the thing that you want. He's like, well, I guess it's time for more green slime. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a very, um, <laughs> it's a very in your face and obvious. Um, it's not subtle. Uh, I'll scream and scream and scream until I'm sick mm. kind of manipulation. Yeah, mostly he's manipulating himself, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, final, final fun question. Who, who, who do you want to fight? Hmm. I kind of want to fight Hal, but mainly just because he needs to speed up his bath routine because he takes all the <laughs> hot water and that's not fair. <laughs> I know, I find Percival vaguely annoying, but that's like not actively enough to actually want to like exert myself about it, you know? Mm. Um, I don't know that I have anyone I want to fight. Yeah. It's an odd one that way, isn't it? Mm. There's... Um... Yeah. So, I think it is time. It is time for what we think our darling dear, what our darling dear Gothmog, our cat, would think of this book. We have a cat rating. It's out of 10. Tends to be a high <laughs> rating if there are actual cats in the book. If there is mm. crimes of like shenanigan level crimes, um, mm. if there's any stabbing or backstabbing because she has <laughs> little claws that she likes to stab people with. So... That is the kind of vibes when we're rating this book. It differs to our own rating. I'll uh, just sort of put that mm-hmm. out there. I mean, I think it's a reasonably high on the basis of there is so much drama. There mm. is a I lot feel of like drama. she'd be very appreciative of the drama and of Howl's need to be the centre of attention at all times. Yeah. I'd go for a seven, I think, because there aren't actually cats mm. in it. There are no cats, so I think we have to deduct points for that. So I think I, I, I agree. I don't know if there's any actual crime, really, is there? Not really. 
No. Is it illegal to make people old? I mean, I bet how no, I bet how's doing tax evasion. <laughs> he's not paying back his student loan because he's yeah, in a no, foreign. I, I, I'll integrate that into my worldview. Yeah. No, this was before student loans, Lottie. It was all free back then. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I, know. Shit. I forgot about that. You wouldn't have student loan. That, oh, that's damn. why I didn't finish PhD because you didn't have a student loan. <laughs> That, that, no, this explains this explains why he was able to do his PhD in like charms and spells. Mm, yeah, because like you don't have to. Pay. Actually, no, I think you probably did have to pay for PhDs. Yeah, but you'd have to have a research, find a research money for it. So tax evasion mm. isn't one of the fun crimes that Gothmog enjoys the most, though. No, no, it's true. So are we still saying a seven? Do we think a six? What do you think? I think I, no, I'm, I'm with the seven. I'm good oh, with seven. seven. Okay, I'm going to officially write it down because I'm going to write it down for this series and then we're going to put it on. <laughs> I'm going to find all the other ratings for all the other episodes. Um, so quickly, before we before we sign off, what else have you guys been reading? Anything to recommend to the collective, to our listeners? <laughs> uh, I have not read anything other than this in the last week since we recorded an episode because uh, my work got <laughs> super, super busy and I have spent all my brain cells on not losing my job. That's being being over dramatic. I'm not gonna lose my job. Um, well, I've been massively nerdy this week in two di- on two different axes. In that the main thing I've been reading is Agora Drus, which is a collection of short stories in Welsh for beginners, uh, <laughs> which is a very surreal experience because it's the the language level of like you know you're you're doing kind of your primary school reading and everything's in present tense and the sentences are all very simple and very. Um, the cat sat on the mat sort of uh, level vocabulary. But the stories are about like a 50 year old guy quitting his job and starting a gym, uh, starting at the gym, a guy getting a train to Reading. And it's very like, you know, random adult situations, <laughs> but in like. What was the train delayed? Did he have to go on delay repay? <laughs> No, I said, this is, this is the actual, like, this is how you can tell that it's, it's still. It's um, fiction. That. Yeah, because <laughs> sure. like the train actually ran, and he got to his he got to his destination on time. Oh my god, <laughs> um, what is this unrealistic yeah. fantasy? It's, it's, it's set it's set in a fantasy um, Cardiff where the trains run. Did the train um, cost like two hundred quid, two hundred pounds to go ten <laughs> the miles? Price, the price of the train, the price of the train was not mentioned. I mean, maybe because it was so expensive. <laughs> maybe he's got an annual return ticket that cost him seven grand. <laughs> And if someone's thinking, is I it really seven grand? Like yes, annual, it is. Annual return ticket is probably too much for my Welsh vocabulary. I'm feeling quite grateful that it didn't it didn't go into those details because I'm not sure I could have handled it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the twist the twist was he's overhearing a conversation in Welsh between two women, and they eventually start talking about how attractive he is and wondering if he's single. And it turns, and then they ask him. In, they start speaking to him in English, and he responds to them in Welsh. And it turns out that they didn't think he spoke Welsh. So they were just talking about him, thinking he couldn't understand them. Oh my God. That's quite a fun twist. And, um, and he's like, surprise, bitch. <laughs> surprise, bitch, I speak Welsh. Never that level of drama when I was learning the cats out on the map. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was a fun time. And then um, because I follow a bunch of people who are into the Silmarillion and they got me into the fanfic. And I know I said I was never going to do it, but I am in fact reading the Silmarillion. That's a thing that's happening. So Silmarillion yeah. episode one. No, no, I'm enjoying it. I am enjoying it more than I did the last time I attempted it, but I still don't think it's a... <laughs> series, series four bonus episode? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I feel like we should do Lord of the Rings first if we're going to... That's gonna... true. We can do that for series yeah. four. But what about you, Lottie? What else have you been reading? I am continuing with my quest of reading Discworld. I'm still listening to soul music which mm-hmm. is the new Puffin. Puffin's done some new audio books of... Um, oh, yeah, I keep seeing them on my Facebook of all places, the like, trailers. I have really, really enjoyed the lady who is... And I'm going to find it because... Mm. Sean Clifford. Mm. I'm really, really enjoying soul music and also because it's got so many puns in it. And that <laughs> the that again, Buddy has like this sort of he's sort of like Tom Jones and he has a Welsh accent and it just makes me so happy. <laughs> so yeah, I really, really am enjoying this this audiobook. It deserves a five star rating on Audible, so 
other <laughs> audi- audio book suppliers are available. But yeah, that's what I'm doing. And mm. yeah, so I guess we probably need to wrap up actually looking at the time. We really need to yeah. wrap up. Sorry, Ro. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, Ro. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a like or a review, depending on what your podcast platform permits. Or let us know. Send us an email at teachingmycattoread at gmail.com. Or you can DM us uh, via our Facebook page, via Instagram, Tumblr. We've got all the social medias. If you want to see a full breakdown, it's all on the website. Also, just go listen to our planning episode because we, I think we have a full breakdown at the end of that of mm-hmm. all the socials that we're on and what is on all of them. I was going to say, I, was having, I, have, I have a breakdown at the end of the episode because I was so tired that my brain stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you can send us a lovely little message, recommend us some books to read and big virtual hugs and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.